Hello and welcome everyone and a very good morning to you and uh, let me bring in our panellists first and introduce them uh, starting with uh, Greta Faremo, United Nations Under Secretary General for the United Nations Office for Project Services, Jamaluddin Ibrahim, Managing Director, President and CEO of uh, Malaysia's uh, Axiata Group, John Rice, Vice Chairman at GE and George Yeo, former uh, Singapore Trade and Foreign Minister and uh, currently Chairman of Kerry Logistics, a Hong Kong listed company. Let's get straight into it. And John, uh, let me start with you. You're probably best placed to offer a view on the regional economy here in ASEAN. How optimistic are you about the future and what are the risks for growth and the outlook? You know, we're very optimistic. Uh, we've been in the, in the region for almost 100 years. Uh, we've seen ASEAN develop in the, last, in the last 50, and we see an important trading block. Uh, you know, these economies have grown on average about 5% over the last 15 years, and that's through the global financial crisis. Uh, our business here has grown in some years at double-digit rates. It's one of our largest regions. And there are important interdependencies. Uh, you know, we've got 9,000 employees. We, we have activities in, in every country. And a lot of what we do in those countries gets exported to other countries. So this, this idea of a, of a trading block, we think, is very important for the region and for companies like GE. And Jamal, if I can turn to you, collectively, as a combined block, as a combined entity, collectively, ASEAN is a formidable economic power. Just give us some color, if you can, on intra-ASEAN demand. If you're referring to the telecom industry, in, or just general economic? Generally, economically, yeah. and in your industry as well. Yeah. Obviously, you know, uh, we, what we are seeing in, the, in, the, in general economy is pretty obvious, and all of you know the, a lot of intra-ASEAN -Asia, uh, dependencies and economic activities. Um, maybe I could stress a bit more on the ICT area. That has been uh, an area that's been growing for sure by every country, and you can see that there, there are uh, different kind of uh, trends going on here. Um, the, of course, ICT industry itself is kind of, there are many components, but let me focus on the three components. The, if you look at mobile industry where I'm in itself, uh, that is, has been growing very fast, but it's plateauing. And in fact, in some countries, it's negative or flat growth, whereas the broadband uh, uh, growth has been growing double digit and still growing very fast. And uh, the new one, of course, the digital economics uh, is growing rapidly in triple digit growth and all that. And in terms of intra-ASEAN, I would say uh, is right now, as we, as we speak, at least in the, uh, is quite limited. And I think this is a subject for our discussion perhaps today, or maybe in, the, in this whole event, to see how ASEAN uh, working together can catalyze this movement of the digital economics. And George, if I can uh, bring you in and talk about economic integration and where we are in the process. Because one of the challenges of closer harmonization and integration is that ASEAN is a very diverse family, isn't it? You have countries like Singapore on one end of the spectrum, you have Philippines and Indonesia somewhat in the middle, and then you have the rising new Asian tigers like Cambodia. How do we mesh them all together? And what are the challenges involved there? You know, it was not very long ago that Cambodia was ripped apart because of external forces. Mm -hmm. This was a tragic, tormented land. And Cambodia joined ASEAN less than 20 years ago. The developments since have been dramatic. And there's a sense of hopefulness. And all that is possible only because there is peace. We peace the Mekong instead of being a dividing line between two worlds. It's now connecting the countries of mainland Southeast Asia. And uh, roads, railroads, optical fibers, ports, airports, all being developed, improving year by year. I'm doing trucking from China to Singapore through more and more bypasses. And there's a sense of hopefulness throughout Southeast Asia. The key is a realistic view of what regional integration can achieve. We cannot be like Europe. 
we are diverse. We will always, we will always remain diverse. We are in between China and India. We must be friendly to everybody and be a completely neutral platform so that all the major powers, all the major economies have a vested interest in our well-being. Then we will prosper. I just want to pick up what you said there. Uh, we cannot be like Europe, and in a way, there are many challenges and there are many lessons that we can learn from uh, Europe. And let me bring in uh, Greta on that note. When you consider uh, the very real challenges and the existential crisis almost that uh, the European Union is facing over its future integrity, what are the lessons from there that we can take away and apply here as we move closer towards integration? I think uh, hearing my fellow panelists talk about the opportunities, it's also about inclusion. It's about leaving no one behind. Uh, so uh, both uh, the connection with uh, the citizens and how we uh, help build jobs is important. And uh, being the executive director of UNOPS, we have been successfully implementing projects also working with the private sector, ensuring those social dimensions. And uh, not to answer your question directly, I think it's all about actually making sure uh, that inclusion and the social dimensions are taken care of. And how far should we go in terms of integration? Do we need to go as far as the European Union model? Do we need to seek a formal union? Do we even have to consider a single currency at some point on the horizon. John, can I bring you in? Oh, sure. Man. Look, I, I, I want to pick up on both the point George made and Greta. I, I think this notion of having borders become points of connection instead of barriers is really impo important. Because if you think about sustainable economic growth, and to, the, to Greta's point, having everybody's boat lifted with the rising tide, you've got to make these points of connection. Whether you have to go all the way to a European Union and a common currency, I don't know. I don't, I don't really think so, but I think that's to be determined. If you can make these borders become points of connection and do it in a way that lets everybody benefit, which is not, it's a lot easier to say than it is to do, then I think you, you, can, you, can, you can exist with a trading block and not necessarily a, the European Union model. And can I ask you to follow up on that? I mean, from a harmonization point of view, from a businessman's perspective, what do you want to see being achieved? What do you want to see in real terms and material terms being done to increase the ease of business and to potentially at some point down the line uh, improve uh, inclusivity? I'd say two things. A, a level playing field in terms of free flow of, of capital uh, and goods, and capital means human capital in addition to financial capital. And then I think countries have to, have to concentrate on the, on the frictional points, you know, that the things that, that are kind of under the surface in terms of getting permits and approvals and moving, as George would know from Carry Logistics, moving goods from one place to the next and making that as easy as possible because those frictional costs, you know, are really insidious when it comes to the, the, the cost of trade. Would you agree with that, George? Do the supply chains are well established here, but they need to be smoother, yes? And the infrastructure deficit and the infrastructure gap in this part of the world is something of a stumbling block. Well, there are problems everywhere, and we face problems every day. But day by day, month by month, there are improvements. And China's One Belt, One Road is an enormous opportunity for all of Southeast Asia. There's a chance now that in the next 10, 20 years, the infrastructural base of ASEAN will improve beyond recognition, both within ASEAN and between ASEAN and its neighbors. There is a chance now as the blood vessels grow, as the blood flows, that many countries in Southeast Asia, in one generation, can make it to near first world status. This is a historic opportunity. And because China is here in a big way, so the Japanese feel a sense of friendly rivalry, the Indians too, and others, all competing to help us. And if we are skillful enough to maintain this foreign policy, 
that everyone will want to be our friend, everyone will have a vested interest in seeing us do well. And internally, we must make sure that we solve problems day by day, they cannot be solved overnight, that we help each other, that we do not allow uh, the natural tensions between neighbours to get out of hand. ASEAN is soft. We don't take decisions by voting. If you have to vote, there's already a rupture. So there's a sense that, look, well, if you cannot solve the problem today, let's hold back. If you can't join in now, exclude yourself, but come in when you're ready. And without ASEAN, Myanmar could not have achieved this peaceful transition. And it's an enormous achievement because even five years ago, no one could have envisaged that this peaceful transition could have taken place. And Greta, if I can give you the final word before we move on to uh, our next uh, theme, which will be uh, trade and uh, opening up market access, etc. Inclusive growth, we hear this time and time again. It's become something of a buzzword. How do we get beyond the sound bite? How do we make it uh, material? Uh I can only mention that uh, we in UNOPS has uh, taken the initiative to working more with the private sector uh, and making sure that we also leverage our cooperation with governments. Uh, when we talk about social housing, for instance, green energy, there may be projects that are not as bankable as they should be, so investors say no. Perhaps we can bring that soft component to the table, have governments take a first loss risk, or actually bringing more investors together, and turn the no to a yes. And people in uh, uh, fragile situations may benefit from solutions, where they access green energy, where they access social housing. So actually finding new ways of working together with the private sector uh, I think is really important to achieve the Agenda 2030 so or really 2025 as the ASEAN countries have uh, So it's really about uh, redefining and refining the private-public partnership. Can you give us a sense of where it is working? Is there a blueprint? Is there a model where it's working in this region that can be applied or scaled up elsewhere? Uh, it would not be for me to say what works and not work, but I think is what is really important that is to develop these new tools where the investors, whether they are private or public, put their money together and make them work at a larger scale uh, compared to what is done today. All right. Thank you for that, Greta. Uh, Giorgio, let me get back to you. ASEAN is where the growth is. That much is sure. But short to medium term, how concerned are you about the rising tide of protectionism? Not within ASEAN itself, because uh, we are a collection of kingdoms and principalities. It's never been a, one empire, historically. Uh, we are, the Malays have a beautiful term for this in Bahasa, Tana di bawa angin. We are the lands below the winds. Half the year, the winds blow one way, half the year, the other way. And it brings in influences from, from China, from India. And the result is very mixed cultures throughout Southeast Asia. And we are connected by the waterways, which was the original internet. So there's no way in the world that we can be seriously protectionistic in ASEAN. We cannot survive by being protectionistic. It's not in our blood. Jamal, would you agree with that? And are we fairly well insulated in this region since a fair few of our economies are not uh, cyclically open? They have very strong demand drivers internally. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, we, are, we would be very concerned if there's uh, a lot more protectionism or nationalism. Uh, in our industry, it's a highly regulated industry. You know, every country has their own rules and so on and so forth. What we can or we cannot do as a foreign company we, we, of course, we are a Malaysian-based company. We operate in 10 countries, and five of the ASEAN countries are where we are, we are operating in. So it, it is a concern. For, for example, in some countries, one or two countries, we can't even operate uh, our tower business, for example, to build infrastructure. We are not allowed to unless we, uh, with some exceptions, we can't, basically. And 
uh, in terms of uh, being able, uh, there, there's, uh, in some of the countries we operate in, I, I won't mention which, which one or the other, there's a huge uh, biasness of uh, nationalistic support for the local company to the uh, detriment of us as a foreign-based company in some of the countries we operate in. And it's obviously it's something that we have... Where would you say that, that is most acute or most pronounced? Where is the biggest uh, problem? I, well, I can mention some countries like Indonesia uh, and so on, but it makes it difficult for us to operate if there's a huge biasness for the, uh, their own national company. Because we, although we are a foreign-based company, we contribute significantly to the economy directly and indirectly. And we, we are advocating uh, the concept of um, uh, the, the digital leapfrog, digital revolution that can tremendously affect the whole ASEAN to the tune of about uh, you know, incremental of one trillion GDP increment by 2026. And to do that, the, uh, that protectionism has to be, uh, we have to be on a level playing field, as John mentioned, uh, from one company to another, from one uh, country to another. So that is, to us, one of the potentially biggest, a big, a big problem to achieve that. So the country to country uh, barriers need to come down. The yeah. playing field needs to be uh, leveled, to borrow right. uh, John's uh, expression. Do you think that you are winning that debate? At this juncture, in some countries, yes. In some countries, not quite. It's a long way to go. But there's scope for compromise. There's scope for compromise. OK. Uh, we were talking about the pivot to China earlier. And John, you and I were talking about this earlier as well. The US seems to be disengaging from this region. It's walked away from TPP, and nature abhors a vacuum. Does China fill the void? And is the pivot towards China something that we can work with, or do we need a more diversified approach to trade? Look, I think, I think China has a long-term strategy which, which you know, demonstrates that it wants to take advantage of successful economic growth in this region and beyond, and the One Belt, One Road strategy is a perfect example of that. You know, we, see, we don't see it as a threat, we see it as an opportunity. We, we, do a, we do a lot in China, and we can work with our Chinese partners in just about every country along the Belt and Road. So, so we have to adjust, we have to pivot. You know, in the beginning, if you go back 30 years, we were in China to, to, to buy things, to export, and to, and to sell into that market for domestic consumption or domestic use. In today's world, you do everything. You're in China for China. You're in China for the rest of the world. You're participating with Chinese partners along the Belt and Road. And it's the way it will work in the 21st century. So, so we have to be you know, bilateral almost everywhere. We're in 180 countries. Uh, we like to take advantage and participate with, in multilateral trade agreements because we think the, the level, level playing field works for everybody, but if, if that's not going to be the case, then we go door to door and we, and we figure it out because, because that's, that's the world we live in. It may not be our choice, but it's our, it's our reality. If we do see increasing government to government deals, then isn't that necessarily crowding up the private sector? Is that something that you're concerned about? I'm sorry. The if we do see more government to government deals being done, isn't that necessarily crowding out the private sector and you guys? I don't think so. I mean, that's one of the reasons we've built a footprint in 180 countries so that we can adjust. Uh, we don't like to see tariffs and trade barriers because we, th we think it constipates the system, right? Uh, but but if, if, if it's required for us, I mean, when we're in Indonesia, Indonesia wants us to be a US company, a global company, and a local company at the same time. And we're equipped to do that. And we've been building that footprint for decades. And so we're going to, we, we hope to be agile enough to adjust. Uh, because at the end of the day, the world needs electric, <laughs> go back to my point before, right? You can't have sustainable, inclusive growth if you don't have electricity, right? It's all bets are off. So you got to, if you're working on that stuff, you're going to be welcome everywhere. George, your thoughts, and let me 
press you specifically on one belt, one road. From your perspective, what do you think it means for longer term market access and from a terms of trade and a trade flows point of view? Should we be welcoming this? Now, every country in Southeast Asia welcomes Chinese investment, wants to be part of One Belt, One Road because it's a golden opportunity to become more connected both domestically within the region and beyond the region. But China is big and China is long in the historical memory of countries in ASEAN. So there's a certain fear that they may become overly dependent on China, that because of these links, China will control you and manipulate you. Because of this, the instincts of Southeast Asian countries is to be promiscuous. Yes, be close to China, but never be exclusively with China. Because of this, the Americans, the Japanese, the Europeans will always be welcome. If you ask Southeast Asian countries to choose between A or B, they'll find it intolerable. They will want to be close to China, and they cannot afford to have China as an enemy. But they do not want China to be the exclusive partner. And because of this, I would say in many respects, the Americans, the Japanese, the Europeans are free riders in Southeast Asia. And this region will always remain open to them, and they should avoid putting pressure on Southeast Asian countries to choose. They don't like that. And China too must understand this, which I think it does. And let me bring in Greta. Some have even gone as far to say that there is a great game, there is a new great game going on in Asia with China and these other powerhouses vying for influence in this region, be it politically, strategically, or economically, similarly in Africa as well, in the developing world more broadly. And the least developed countries are stuck in the middle. Is that a fair assessment? I hear the discussion about the role of multilateralism. It has been a discussion for decades. Uh, what will small countries benefit from? What will uh, weaker groups benefit from? To me, it comes back again to uh, uh, inclusion. What rules of engagement do we have to secure equal opportunities for all? I'm a Norwegian, I come from a small country. We always benefited from open trade and uh, also were very vocal on the need for a fair framework of uh, engagement. So uh, for us, again in the UN, it is about how to secure also inclusion for uh, those fragile and poor countries who would uh, not immediately benefit from the opportunities we speak about here. Let me just follow up on that because uh, I find Norway fascinating because you have access, you're blessed with oil, and you've been very prudent. You've developed a sovereign wealth fund to spread the wealth and to invest in the long term. A lot of these developing countries within uh, ASEAN and Asia, for that matter, the broader region, are blessed with resources. Take Myanmar, for example, oil and gas, gemstones. How can countries like Myanmar, that are blessed with natural resources, avoid the av resources curse and ensure that the resources wealth is spread equitably? So I can only refer to my Norwegian uh, experience and uh, if you go back, you have to go back more than 100 years. Uh, what institutions were needed? Uh, what investments were needed? What legislation was needed? And how uh, to prioritize? So we were already managing water back uh, more than 100 years ago. And uh, the way we did that, making sure that the national resources remained on national hands, but well developed and how we invested in education and over decades actually built strong institutions that we were able to govern ourselves. I think were very important to our management of oil and gas. But as some have said, the oil and gas was found in Norway in a decade that actually made it possible for Norway to 
make its choices, they are maybe not available this decade. So I would be very careful in advising other nations how they should go about it. But strong institutions, strong investments in education, making sure it was equally distributed was very solid parts of our solutions. Sri, I think, I think that's the point. I mean, natural resources become a curse when you don't take advantage of the blessing to diversify your economy. And, and I think the yeah. countries that have done that or are trying to do that, Nor Norway has done it, and, and banked a lot of the benefits from natural resources to invest for future generations. Human capital has always been a focus in the country, have, you know, have been able to avoid the curse uh, other countries have exploited the wealth for immediate use and corruption uh, and not taken advantage of the opportunity to diversify. Look at what's going on in Saudi Arabia now with Vision 2030. That's all about economic diversification and moving away from the basic energy industries. And it's such an important strategy to the success of that kingdom. It could be done in any country, including Myanmar, that has the advantage of nat some natural resources. John, thank you for that. And let's move on to the issue of uh, new technology. And I wanted to bring in big data, which has been described as the new oil. And how can businesses, policymakers, and civil society for that matter, harness what is increasingly being seen as a 21st century resource? And what does it mean for ASEAN? Let's bring in our resident um, tech expert first. Uh, Jamal, <laughs> your thoughts? I wouldn't say I'm a tech expert for sure. Um, big data, I mean, I guess we, we are using that word quite generically, quite in a, in, in a broad sense of the word on digital analytics and you know, uh, information. Definitely, it's an area that all governments must not take a passive view. They must take an active view on how to accelerate the growth and uh, the development of big data. Uh, there are two sides of the coin here. One is the, to accelerate that uh, the industry or sub-industries that promote uh, data, like telecommunications company, uh, even uh, finance, banking, and so on. Um, and also the skills required. I do not think that we, in, a, in ASEAN as a, as a region, we have enough skills, for that matter, many countries in the world, to have enough skills to harness the development of uh, big data analytics. Uh, we, we know many of the companies themselves, we are losing dozens and dozens. We brought in people, they left. We brought people, they left. This is a serious issue. Then there are other uh, policy issues with regard to cybersecurity, policy issues with regard to uh, data privacy. Uh, that has to be all in harmonized together with the, the positive development of big data. So can, I, can I just ask you, the regulatory framework simply is not keeping up. And you can say, you can say this, you can apply, apply it to, to a global context. Mm -hmm. It's simply not keeping up with the exponential advances that this technology is making at an astounding rate, yes? For sure, yeah, it's not keeping up with it. And some, uh, in fact, some require less regulation for, you know, in, in, in areas like uh, financial, uh, FinTech area should be less uh, regulation, uh, be able to, um, harness the, 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 the benefits of data across the region, there should be less uh, regulation. But regulation with regards to data privacy, I think is something is important. Re regulation with regards to cybersecurity, if it's coming really acute, that has to be uh, stepped up. Okay. The role of uh, technology as an enabler, George, you were uh, talking about this earlier, and I think other members of the panel uh, were. Talk to me about how it works in terms of least developed countries, for example, like Myanmar and Cambodia, using technology to leapfrog their economy into the next phase. Are we necessarily talking about completely bypassing the manufacturing stage of this transition, or is that a necessary stage? The, the social media is remarkably well developed in Southeast Asia, partly because of the young population, and growing rapidly. Governments which make use of the social media to improve governance will be able to maintain sustainable growth because then you're forced to respond to problems. You take, say, Prime Minister Hun Sen. He has an enormous following, 
among young people in Cambodia. In fact, some say that he's governing through Facebook. I checked yesterday, he had slightly fewer than 7.7 .7 million followers. When I checked this morning, he's crossed 7.7 .7 million followers. And he's required every minister in Cambodia to monitor comments on Facebook and to respond to them. Now, to me, this is quite astonishing because governing by Facebook? But why not? It allows you to penetrate through layers of bureaucracy. And problems which fester on the ground cannot fester too long because they get surfaced directly to him. And the ministers do not want the prime minister saying, look, uh, have you read these comments? The key is, how do you use this for better governance? And how do you make mobile data cheaper and cheaper in Southeast Asia? I dream of the day when roaming charges are removed in ASEAN. In, Eu in Europe, in China, they're removing roaming charges. And it can be done. But it requires a certain political will. And this is one area where uh, I hope, Jamal, you can persuade uh, <laughs> your, your, your friends in government to give yeah. this a big push. Mm. And I think it will make a big difference to us. Yeah. If I may comment on that, Please do. I mean, uh, I will talk about roaming, then I'll talk about broadband, which is something I'm passionate about. I, I agree with you. Eventually, this roaming is artificial. It's very artificial where one two country to another. After all, connectivity in the air doesn't matter which country belongs to which country. The, the problem, perhaps, is that there's a huge beneficiary and also losers in this game. So we've got to find a mechanism to equate that. So if you're a country like uh, Malaysia and Singapore, you are the beneficiary of roaming. Uh, because you know the the people coming in the inbound roaming you huge charges you make a lot of money out of that uh, some countries like uh, Cambodia is the other the other side of the coin so they need a mechanism even within ourselves to be very frank within our group we're trying to find a formula and it's been extremely difficult within all the com companies that we have so that we uh, we are working towards that actually so your point is it is coming and it's inevitable but there must be is some. It coming from Asiata? Well, one of the we are, could, could be one of the architects of, to make this happen. We're going to a catalyst to make this happen. But we need an internal sort of uh, balance of accounts, so to speak, to subsidize certain country versus other countries that we, we operate in, to make it such that everybody gain rather than there's losers and winners. Greta. Uh, actually, new technology can help us connect people in such a big and different way. Uh, UNOPS has the experience to connect uh, uh, mainstream technology with, for instance, uh, entrepreneurs who would develop jobs in their local uh, environment. So think of uh, health. Uh, you can develop apps that can monitor, for instance, certain diseases, and you can also if needed, use drone technology to bring medicine to people who have chronic diseases. A lot of opportunities for education as well. We connect Harvard University and MIT to those innovation hubs that can be placed all over the world so people have access to education that would be, of course, far too expensive to achieve if they had to go to those universities, but now can benefit from the virtual opportunity to access education. So those opportunities from uh, technology is really important. And we spoke about China. We also are engaged in UNOPS in projects in the agricultural sector, actually allowing farmers to market their goods using new technology. So they have shorter access to markets compared to what they had earlier. And the cost curve, the beautiful thing about all this is that the cost curve is coming down. Exactly. And the costs to begin with of sensor technology and drone technology, for example, are minimal, I would imagine. So there's no shortage of public-private partnerships who would want to fund this. Exactly. That's uh, also uh, interesting to see because it offers opportunities not only to build jobs and uh, growth, but also to uh, get the return from investments, um, of course, that uh, is needed to, to uh, make this sustainable. OK. We've heard a lot about uh, the fourth industrial revolution here at uh, ASEAN, the World Economic Forum. 
I just want to go around the panel and just ask each of you what it means for you and where we are on that road. And let's start with George, please, if you can. We have the advantage in ASEAN of a young population. Once they're educated, they'll take to the new technology, like fish to water. And we mustn't miss this opportunity. We mustn't wait for them to accumulate years. There's no time to lose. And this must be an area of the highest priority. I would not worry too much about uh, the very high-tech stuff, big data analysis. Uh, you, in those areas, we must expect uneven development, and the big players may well be outside the region. But governments should make use of the technology to help govern better, and people should use the technology to help them disintermediate rapacious middlemen in the system. In this way, farmers, small traders can get better access to markets, can buy cheaper and sell dearer. John. I'll take a human capital angle. I think, you know, I started with GE in 1978, and, and people actually thought in the 70s and 80s that you could get a job, do it for a long time, plan to retire from the company that you started with and live happily ever after, and not much would change. And if you look at the 21st century and the fourth industrial revolution, uh, it, to me, it says that every, every job is going to change. The, the nature, what George just described, will change hundreds of thousands of jobs if, if it really happens, and it likely will. Uh, everybody has to prepare for the 21st century knowing that what they do today to be successful is not necessarily what they're going to do tomorrow to be successful. So how do we, how do we teach people to and train them to be adaptable and flexible, whether you're in accounts payable, a distributor, a doctor, and it doesn't matter what you do or who you do it for, your job is going to change. And so for me, success in the context of the fourth industrial revolution means that you have to have a workforce, people, human capital that is adaptable and flexible, lifelong learning, and ready to change as the nature of work and jobs change. Well, let's start with the, uh, the go back to the third revolution, which is the IT revolution. Um, and the fourth revolution is to go beyond digital revolution into artificial intelligence, into robotics, uh, into virtual reality, augmented, augmented reality, and so on and so forth. If, if where we are right now, we're still in a third, struggling in a third revolution, to be very candid about it. We are not quite there in beyond uh, the uh, digital revolution. We are still in uh, the uh, building the infrastructure required. We are still in the basics of a couple of internet um, businesses of ideas or entrepreneurship that we are building. So we are, we are not quite there yet, to be frank, uh, if I can be candid about it. Th that's why, you know, again, coming back to my uh, you know, why I'm here and, why, and we are big advocacy of broadband being a national agenda, not a telecom agenda, not this little industry called IT, but the whole national agenda because it, it touches every human being. It's the basis of which fourth uh, revolution can ever succeed. You need that baseline upon which new economics, new digital economics, and therefore beyond digital revolution can happen. So we're not quite, we're quite, not quite there yet. So, you know, I, I hope you have uh, 700 uh, business leaders here, <coughs> opinion leaders, political leaders here, to put that in national agenda where it requires thinking, rethinking about regulatory, rethinking about uh, things like spectrum, uh, the industry structure, uh, incentive, funding, you know, and capital, human capital bill. There's a lot of things need to be done. We are still there. And however, uh, as mentioned by George, we are in a sweet spot here. We have a young population uh, of you know uh, 40 percent uh, millennials. We have uh, uh, 630 million population. We have uh, the in a way the, the demographic behavior of the people in ASEAN is generally more uh, adaptable to new technologies. So we have a sweet spot here. Now we have a sweet spot here. We have a great opportunity in the future, but we are still in the, shall I say, in the third revolution, and we can leapfrog. I think that's the point. We can leapfrog if we get this national agenda of broadband, uh, get it corrected and accelerate. We need to accelerate. That's that's why we, it cannot be just a, a 
telecom agenda, it's got to be national agenda, as important as any economic activities. It's the basis of the future, the way I look at it. And I'm very passionate about it. Greta, if I could just frame the question in a different way, and I do want to ask you about what the fourth industrial revolution means to you, but there's been quite a lot of talk here about uh, the skill shortage amongst young people and whether human capital is leaving or staying. What can we do from the policymakers' perspective, from the business perspective, to help ensure the best and the brightest minds stay where they are? I think, uh, again, uh, coming back to investment in the human capital and social inclusion, where is it attractive for young people, bright people to stay? It is where it is safe to stay, where it is uh, viewed as uh, uh, a good place to live. So uh, if you look at how technology has developed, you find in areas where both taxes are high and where the costs may be high, still a lot of growth and development and why. I think that question is really important to ask. Why has some of the biggest uh, tech companies invested in the part of the world where I come from, uh, Northern Europe? Maybe it is because highly educated people uh, built families and jobs and opportunities that actually also benefit investors long term. But I would like to also bring another dimension into uh, your question because technology allows us to build more resilient societies, more resilient infrastructure. In this part of the world, we have floods, earthquake, and other disasters. And access to information allow us to actually design smarter cities, allow us to build more resilient buildings, allow us to build more resilient agriculture, all these things that matters to people. Why invest in something that will actually sort of flow away with the next uh, flood, go away with the next earthquake? Are we ready to invest more upfront? I think Technology introduces a completely different discussion about how we do these things right in the first place. We've reached uh, the end of our panel, and uh, if I can just uh, ask each panelist just to give us some final words of wisdom and uh, a summation, just to bookend our discussion, I think that that will be uh, very valuable. And let's start right at the end with George, first of all. We have a great advantage in ASEAN in our outward orientation. You take this meeting here in Phnom Penh, everyone feels comfortable here. You can be from Japan, China, you can be from Europe, from, from America, from India. It's an uh, open platform. You will not feel this way in Beijing or in Delhi or in Tokyo or in New York, but you feel it here. And not just in Cambodia, but throughout Southeast Asia. So it's in the soil, it's in the culture. And as Asia develops, this will become the Caribbean for all of Eurasia because long coastlines, beautiful beaches, salubrious weather, good food, service orientation. So if we get governance right and we educate our people and make sure there's law and order and good health, the conditions are extremely favorable in Southeast Asia. This is a golden opportunity not to be missed. There are challenges, but we have to respond to these challenges. And I think there's a fair chance that most of us will be able to. You know, Sri, I, I think it's uh, sustainable economic growth, as we've talked about, is, is, is a, has a lot of factors. Um, you know, at the end, it's about creating jobs. If you want to keep people in the region, you got to have jobs. And they have to be the right kind of jobs. They can't be the jobs that will be disintermediated. You know, if you're a distributor today and you're, you're collecting 3% commission and not creating any value, then technology will disintermediate you at some point. It may be 2017, it may be 2027, it may be 2037. But those distributors in tomorrow's world Will, will, there'll be no value from them and they will go away. So the, 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 the key for me 
the underpinning of sustainable economic growth is job creation and the creation of uh, uh, the development of human capital and, and the creation of workforces that can change and adapt and grow with the requirements that will come in the 21st century. If you don't do that, then there's no way you can have sustainable economic growth. I mean, look at Myanmar. Myanmar, we were one of the first U.S. companies to go into Myanmar after the, the sanctions were, were, were removed. I went there the first time six years ago. Uh, my smartphone didn't work. My iPad didn't work. My, I had terrible connectivity. My most recent trip in January, everything worked, okay? But there's still 35 million people in the country that don't have electricity, right? So there, that's no, there's nothing inclusive about that, but it shows you how much progress can be made in a relatively short period of time and also how much more work is left to do. But if we don't create jobs in Myanmar, it's going to be impossible for that development to take place. For me, again, being repetitive, but it's a very important point, this, the three points. One is the one trillion GDP, incremental GDP opportunity by 2026 for ASEAN. There's a work done actually with Commission 80 continue to do for us, and that's opportunity for broadband. Second, broadband should be a national agenda. It cannot be just passively or naturally or gradually uh, being led by the, uh, the, the players. It got to be uh, more offensive by the government and the uh, public sector and private sector got to work together uh, to, in the whole ecosystem. It got to be a, a, a policy to make that happen. It creates jobs, it's important for human capital, and so on and so forth. That's the second point. Uh, and it covers every society. It's not just about the, the people who are the rich and, the, uh, and so on. It covers, it helps the financial inclusion. It reaches every aspect of society, uh, including helps, hopefully, the uh, seamless roaming uh, that uh, everyone is uh, thinking about in the future. And third is that this is uh, kind of related to the second one, an opportunity for us to leapfrog. We are in the third revolution. We can leapfrog uh, the developed countries within the next few years. We get the second right. That's my three key points. Yeah, ASEAN offers such uh, great opportunities. Uh, uh, and uh, I still think we need to find ways of working better together. Urbanization is uh, real in this part uh, of the world at a level that we've not seen before also taking into consideration the years to come. And uh, the world will benefit if we do uh, find the right solutions uh, the first time. I mean, find the green energy solutions. How do we fight? and actually uh, build inclusiveness into slum areas and introduce social housing. How do we uh, cl provide clean water? All these things that matters to people. So uh, to the UN and uh, to UNOPS, it's uh, all about how we can help support building national capacity to uh, find ways of working together, also financially to provide scale to the solutions that we know we need to find. Greta, thank you very much indeed for that. And uh, that brings us to uh, the end of our CNBC debate here at ASEAN at the World Economic Forum. I'd like to thank uh, all our panelists, starting with Greta Faremo, UN Under Secretary General for the United Nations Office for Project Services, Jamaluddin Ibrahim, Managing Director, President and CEO of Axiata, John Rice, Vice Chairman of GE, and George Yeo, former Singapore Trade and Foreign Minister and Chairman at uh, Kerry Logistics. And thank you, the audience, uh, for watching, and uh, we will see you again very soon here at ASEAN. Okay, uh, we now have another 15 minutes or so in which we can carry on the conversation and invite uh, some audience participation. We are done with the television part of the uh, debate, so we can still uh, carry on the conversation and invite some questions from, uh, from the floor. So I'll just let 
a few of the folks uh, just settled down here, and uh, then we can start the q and A. I think we have went a little bit over, so we have about uh, 10 or 15 minutes. And I think we have uh, some colleagues in the audience with uh, roving mics as well. I'll we'll just uh, wait for everyone to settle down first of all. Right. Shall we begin? Who would like to get the ball rolling? Yes, sir. If you can, uh, can we have a mic for the gentleman here right at the front of the audience? And so, if you could be good enough to say uh, who you are and where you're from, please. Uh, Rami Sharaf, senior vice president of the Royal Group in Cambodia. Uh, I want to comment on the connectivity, the digital connectivity, and offering. Uh, faster and cheaper uh, uh, digital connectivity to be the solid platform to build on the fourth revolution that we are talking about. Uh, I want to welcome everyone in Cambodia and I want to share uh, one example of that connectivity that connected Cambodia, Malaysia and Thailand. And this is an initiative that was done by a local company in Cambodia called Royal Group connecting the first submarine fiber optic connection. And this was done on 15th March with, a, with an investment of $100 million. So this Cambodia, the, the, the uh, developing uh, sister among the big family of ASEAN, uh, uh, did it. And that was a great example to come to uh, uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Giorgio mentioned about how can we get no roaming, no, 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 no charges, and get into that uh, actual uh, accessibility. So this is just, just a comment. The other comment is our role as business leaders, and here we have 600, 700, and I think one major uh, uh, point is how proactive is the private sector in ASEAN? Many will think, well, you know, governments are not doing a good job. Well, we should take the lead and we should come to the governments with what we believe as ambitious, what we believe as feasible, what we believe as the coming steps to build this solid, strong uh, body called, called ASEAN, which should be operational. So once we come to that point of being proactive, governments will surely uh, uh, react and we know that in, in, in countries like Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, Thailand, the governments couldn't, couldn't stand still when we had these proactive, uh, this proactive private sector. They came with better regulation, they came with uh, certain processes, they needed to invest in, in basic infrastructure, in education, human capital. So all these uh, pillars to build that ideal model should come from us as proactive private sector. Your thoughts, please. So, uh, look, look, I think you're right. And I can tell you from our perspective, we are a regular, we have, as I mentioned before, 9,000 people in the ASEAN region. We have regular senior level contact with every government in the ASEAN region to talk about things that we can do and they can do to facilitate the development of infrastructure projects. So I think, to me, that's what comes with a bilateral world, right? We can't, can't wait for yeah. TPP. We, we have to go door to door. And what allows us to be successful is engaging with these governments to understand what their agenda is and how we can marry that with our agenda. And, and that's the nature of, of of the 21st century in a bilateral world for a company like GE. And we can't, we will not stop that. Even if TPP was reconstituted tomorrow, we will still build a strategy around a bilateral approach because what Indonesia needs is a little bit different than what Cambodia needs, and that's a little different than what the Philippines needs. 
I guess I look at it, the, the, the three components, right? You know, everything we do, there's one component, you, there's nothing, it's beyond your control. There's nothing much you can do, you don't spend time on that. There's another component of uh, things that you can't, don't, don't have much control, especially with regards to like TPP or the government actions or policies and all that, but we can, we can have influence. So we spend our efforts advocating like what I'm trying to do on the broadband, trying to advocate and come up with a proposal. But in reality, as I, you kind of you alluded to, a big chunk of the things that we can do something ourselves, the private sector should take the initiative. So for us, for example, um, yeah, we need help from Spectrum, we need help on many other regulations with regards to broadband and so on. We decided to say, okay, we're going to spend, uh, like this year, we're going to spend to the tune of 6.5 billion or what is that, uh, close to 2 billion, 1.7, 1.6 billion US dollar to roll out primarily broadband. We, we, to, help, to help the digital entrepreneurs, uh, we need help, but we decided that, okay, while we, we can't solve the whole world's problem or ASEAN problem, we decided to invest in Malaysia to the tune of about, you know, uh, we build a fund together with our partners, uh, about 20, 25 million US dollar fund to fund the digital entrepreneurs uh, in Malaysia. And recently, about a few weeks ago, we, small fund, in the scheme of things, it's very small, but it's a good start. We, we put in five million dollar US, to help small little companies in Cambodia to jumpstart their digital, all these digital entrepreneurs. And I can go on and on, but you're right, absolutely. We can't wait for the whole world to help us. We got to do it ourselves. George. Although most tariffs have been zero uh, in ASEAN, non-tariff measures uh, remain a big problem. And some tell me that it's getting worse. Crossing borders uh, is not always easy in Southeast Asia. But with highways, with better connectivity, and with more and more multinationals coming to ASEAN, they have a lot of influence in ensuring that the procedures for crossing border are properly codified and regularized. Local players will always find it difficult, say in agricultural products, but multinationals here can play a big role. And they have access to ministers. Wherever they, whichever country they visit in Southeast Asia. John, uh, I'm just really curious because you use the example, and it's a great example of Myanmar five or six years ago, 0G connectivity. Yeah. Now you have 4G, if I'm not mistaken. So what drove that impetus? Did it come from government saying, let's just do it, let's make some progress here with conviction? Or was it business pushing it? Who, who was the leading agency here? Right. I, think it's a, I think it's both. Yeah. I mean, I, it, doesn't, it doesn't happen unless the government makes it a priority. I think it's a, it's a good example of pretty far-sighted, you know, effort on behalf of the new, at the time, government in Myanmar, and then, and then companies that lined up to support it. Yeah. So I think it's, it exactly illustrates the point that, that, I, that, I, that, I, that I mentioned before. And you need that because, because there has to be private investment to make it work. It's not going to be funded completely by the government. But the investors need to know that the government is behind this strategy and it's an important priority for the government. Thank you, sir, for that question. Uh, let's take one more at the back here. Yes, sir. I'm Ian Grundy from the Adeco Group. I had a question for John. John, you talked about technology and the fourth industrial revolution and how that will change jobs. And that all jobs are gonna change at some point in the future. And obviously I think all of us agree with that. In an organization the size of GE, one of the world's largest employers, how do you do that talent planning? How do you look at the different parts of the business, think about what's gonna be needed in 10, 15 years from now? Well, we, it, you know, we probably spend a billion dollars a year on training, but we've also realized over the last 10 years that we have to train our own people differently. You know, you know I grew up in a world where vertical skills were more important than horizontal skills. You know, you, you, I was in finance and I was taught to stay in my swim lane and swim fast and touch the wall work first and I would be rewarded with a promotion and more salary and it was a very vertical siloed world because it was slower and, and that worked. In today's world, you can't have leaders that operate like that because, because your horizontal skills and ability to cut across an organization, 
matter as much as your vertical or your domain competence. And I'd argue for governments, because governments, you know, including the United States and Western Europe, notoriously siloed, suboptimal in performance, I think, as a result of that. This, this idea that you have to train for a different type of leadership in the 21st century is, is permeating GE, and we're still figuring out how to do that. But reskilling and retraining and teaching people to adapt to what I, that's a point I made before, is, is the focus of our training efforts, not imparting a, ver a specific skill, right? Which is what we tried to do 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Do we have any more questions? I feel a little bit like a deer in the headlight because I can't quite see <laughs> people way over here. Back, but so. yes, there's a gentleman who has a question here. Yes, sir, please. Right to the front, please. Yes. Good morning. My name is Wong Se Misot. I'm a secretary of state for Ministry of Economy and Finance. I believe most of you have business in Cambodia. But before you leave this session, I would like to seek your advice on Cambodia's future directions. What you would say, the most urgent thing to do for Cambodia in the next three years to be successful? <laughs> First of all, did everyone hear the question correctly? No. What was the question? Right. If I'm not mistaken, sir, what's the most urgent priority for this country, for Cambodia, in the next three years? Yes. That's the question. Um, Greta, do you want to take that one first? Then we'll go around the panel, and we'll have to make that the, the last one, I'm afraid, because we'll be crashing into the other session. So my approach would, of course, be uh, how do we develop sustainable solutions regarding the core areas ranging from energy needs to uh, education and uh, build from, from there, actually, how do you secure building the national capacity. But the overall um, political priorities would, of course, have to be set nationally. And as a UN official, I would not dare to go into that space. Jamal. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, <laughs> but I share the sensitivity. Jamal, please. For, for me, it sounds like broken record. It sounds like I'm a hammer. Look, everything looks like nails to me. But certainly, not the only, but uh, back to broadband, I think uh, Cambodia can benefit tremendously and can leapfrog as a country. Um, the mobile industry, in fact, is growing faster than most of the neighboring countries in ASEAN. And broadband, of course, is very low penetration. When I say broadband, fixed and fixed wireless broadband, that can be accelerated. And the digital economy that goes along with it, that sits on top of that, can be accelerated. So I think that should be the priority. And that should be the competitive angle that Cambodia as a country can differentiate within ASEAN and, of course, with, uh, outside ASEAN. You know, the infrastructure challenges that remain in Cambodia require foreign capital to be solved. Uh, the best way to attract foreign capital is to give investors visibility, and that visibility has to be over a number of years. Ch China, you know, taught us all with the development of five-year plans that actually mean something and allow you to line up under a, a set of priorities, and, and if you work you can be successful. So, so I'd suggest have a plan, publicize the plan, and stick with the plan so that you can attract the capital to build out the broadband infrastructure to develop power generation where it needs to be developed, build out health care where it needs to be built out. You need, you need a combination of public and private efforts, and a long-term, more visible plan will help you get those external investors. Uh, Minister, two, two days ago, I visited Sihanoukville. Uh, it was my first visit there. I saw the port which was uh, built with assistance from Japan. I saw the Chinese Special Economic Zone, which is about 10 square kilometers, and two, three hundred factories already operating, and the plans for the future are exciting. You have now, in the next two, three years, an opportunity to avail yourself of enormous assistance 
from China, Japan and other countries to help develop your infrastructure. Don't miss this tide. It will not flow forever. So in the coming years when it is flowing, ride it as much as you can. Internally, you are a country reborn. And you have so many young people. And we met many of them yesterday at the open forum. Education is a key. And if you must scream on everything else, invest in education, because that is your future. Ladies and gentlemen, on that note, we will uh, end the session there. We hope you found it as uh, useful and informative uh, as I have. I've learned a lot, certainly, from all our panelists. Let's just give them a round of applause one last time. But for Remo, Ramalu Bini Ibrahim, John Rice of GE, and uh, George Yeo. And thank you for your participation. Thank you very much. That was fantastic.